Welcome everybody to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Julie Hill and I'm a horticulture outreach specialist for Rock and Walworth counties. I'll be one of your moderators today. I also have Steve Tomasco here. He is a outreach specialist with the pesticide applicator training program here in Wisconsin. He'll be your other moderator today. We are so happy that you are joining us and PJ Leash today during pollinator week. We have webinars and events and activities happening all week long to help celebrate and recognize and become aware of our pollinators. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get to PJ's presentation today. Um, we want you to use the Q&A function for any questions you have. We'll get to questions with PJ towards the end. So please put them in the Q&A and we will be monitoring that. You can find this on the bottom of your screen. There should be a Q&A button. Or if you are on a tablet or a cell phone, if you tap your screen, a menu will come up and then you can see the Q&A there. So we're not monitoring the chat for any questions. Later on, we'll drop a few links in the chat for you to fill out a survey and any links that you need to know from there. We are recording this presentation, so it will be available on our Extension Horticulture website in the next week or so. So without further ado, thank you so much, PJ, for being here. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Julie, for the wonderful introduction and, and Steve for helping behind the scenes today. And uh, it's a pleasure to be joining you all during Pollinator Week, uh, talking about some of Wisconsin's bees. Uh, and uh, if there's one take home message I'd like you all to get from today's talk, it's that when you think about the term bee, what the general public often thinks of is just kind of the very tippy top of the iceberg. So I'm going to talk about briefly pollinators in general, and bees are of course one type of very important pollinator. Um, but when it comes to bees alone, there's a lot of types out there. And so folks are familiar with some of these like honeybees and, and bumblebees. But in Wisconsin, we actually have about 500 or so species of bees. In North America, we're well over 3,000, and there's probably close to about 20,000 or so uh, worldwide. So there's a lot of different types of bees out there. Each of them can look different, they can behave differently, and have different habits as well. So that's what the main focus of today's talk is, is to give you uh, some perspective and take you on a survey of some of these bees that uh, you can very easily find in your own yard or in your neighborhood, so you can recognize them and know a little bit about them and, and what they're doing out there today. So first and foremost, it is pollinator week. Let's talk about pollinators. In its simplest term, a pollinator is any creature moving pollen from one flower to another. And so if I were to just walk down the sidewalk and, and ask folks about pollinators uh, and to name a pollinator, they're probably going to name this one on the left first, honeybees. And without a doubt, honeybees are very important uh, in terms of agricultural uh, pollination services and, and things like that. But that's simply one species of bee. Uh, another common one, and, and by the way, if you asked a kid, a, you know, a four, five, six-year-old kid to draw a picture of a bee, they're probably going to draw a picture more closely aligned with like a bumblebee, black and yellow stripes on the abdomen and, and things like that. And most folks are very well aware of bumblebees, pretty large, robust in size in a lot of cases and, and generally pretty hairy in appearance. But if you think about bumblebees alone, we actually have many species here in Wisconsin and I'll get more into those details in a minute. So those are of course two very important pollinators, but then the bulk of our diversity in Wisconsin around North America, around the world are really these wild bee species. These are, are, for the most part, native creatures. And some of these you've maybe heard of, things like sweat bees. Uh, I find most folks have at least heard of those. But we have many types of sweat bees out there. There's also some very specialized ones, like squash bees, that if you grow pumpkins or squash or related cucurbit crops in your garden, you may have some of those around. There's leaf cutter bees, there's cellophane bees. So again, today's talk is really going to dive into uh, the details of this slide uh, in a lot more details to let you know about these bees and let you know some the kinds that are out there. I'm also going to share a bunch of resources uh, as well. And then, of course, bees have really evolved over 100 million years to be good pollinators in most cases. Um, but I do want to point out that bees are not the only insect pollinator out there. We're learning more and more all the time about moths and butterflies that can really be great pollinators. Beetles 
And numerically speaking, we probably have many more beetle pollinator species in Wisconsin than bees, because we only have about 500 species of bees in the state. We've got a couple thousand species of beetles in Wisconsin. So many of those can be pollinators, although they often go unnoticed or unrecognized for their pollination services. If we look in the upper right-hand corner, look at that wasp. That's a, a typical yellow jacket type wasp. But look at the thorax in the head, the, the first and second body regions, really quite hairy and fuzzy in appearance. And we can see all the pollen grains stuck to it. So we may not necessarily be happy about those insects if we've gotten stung or we have a nest on the side of our house, but they actually can do some pretty good pollination as well. And then flies. A lot of times the general public writes off flies as being bad because they might spread disease or we just see them in kind of icky locations like on roadkill animals and stuff like that. But it turns out flies are critical pollinators in some parts of the planet. Uh, we see plenty of fly pollinators here in Wisconsin, but if you go to high elevations up in the mountains or up in the Arctic tundra, it's basically too cold for bees to be active and flies carry the weight of pollination services in those habitats on the planet. So for some parts of the globe, flies are the single most important pollinator out there. And then, of course, there's other creatures that can be pollinators as well. Bats in some cases, uh, birds in some cases like hummingbirds, and even mammals in, in some cases can be pollinators as well. And technically, if all the insects disappeared, you and I might be employed as pollinators. We might be out in a crop field with little paintbrushes moving pollen from one flower to another. So again, anything that's moving pollen around could be considered a pollinator. And if we look at the importance of pollinators, without a doubt, very, very important agriculturally and botanically speaking. If we made a list of all the uh, flowering plants on the planet and a lot of food crops fall in there as well, it's about 75 to 80 percent of all those plants rely on insects for at least some pollination services. And if you think about our big uh, food crops and things like that, it's about a third of our food supply relies really importantly on uh, insect pollination pollination, including bees. So if you think about uh, some very important crops here in Wisconsin, things like cranberries, we're the number one cranberry producer in the U.S. Cranberries rely very heavily on bees for pollination. Uh, think of our orchard settings uh, in many parts of the state, but especially a, a location like Door County where we've got apples and cherries and other fruit as well. You go out west to places like California, where they have mile after mile of almond groves, rely very heavily on honeybees for pollination and, and places like that. So there's a, a lot longer list of crops. But in a nutshell, if we went to the grocery store and looked at the produce section, that's basically because of bees and other pollinators. So uh, if those insects disappeared, the grocery store would be a very different place overall. Uh, and if we put an economic number, a dollar sign next to this, these insects would really be contributing billions every single year. So um, they do play some very, very important roles in our food supply, but also economically speaking, they're important as well. Now let's take a quick glance at the origin of bees. So bees have been around for about 130 or so uh, million years. That's when they first started evolving. And they actually came from a group that we would commonly refer to as the sand or, or digger wasps. This is a, a family called the family Cribronidae. And we still have these around. We have species of these in Wisconsin. But uh, within this group, there were certain insects that evolved. And they basically switched from hunting uh, insects as a food source for their young to gathering pollen and nectar as a protein and carbohydrate source. So many of their behavioral aspects, though, are similar. Uh, we're going to talk about this, especially for some of our solitary bees, where they will nest in a little tunnel in the ground. Will these sand or digger wasps do the same thing? Uh, behaviorally, it's just that they are hunting for insect prey to bring back to the nest and feature the young versus the bees that are gathering pollen and nectar. So there's actually quite a few similarities. And when I talk about some of the bees today, we actually have some bees that can have a very wasp-like appearance. And there are some wasps out there that can have a pretty bee-like appearance. So sometimes those uh, appearances can be a little bit misleading. But uh, the reason I want to point this out is, again, just to highlight that bees have been around a very, very long time, since kind of the early to mid Cretaceous period, so when dinosaurs are walking the earth. And uh, they have had over 100 million years to evolve with plants. That means they have this long and uh, closely knit association, hence the importance uh, for a lot of plants and pollination services. Now, this is a cool chart from uh, colleagues at University of Minnesota, their bee lab and, and bee squad programs. 
And I know there's a lot of information here, but I think it tells a very cool message. And if we look at this pie chart, one thing that stands out to me is this wedge, very narrow wedge right at the 12 o'clock position. Those are the honeybees, one species, and then bumblebees. And in the US and in North America, we got about almost 50 species there. That's one little wedge of the pie. So remember I mentioned earlier that if I ask folks to name a pollinator, they usually mention honeybee or, or bumblebee. And yes, those are important, but look at the rest of the pie chart. It's all these other bee species. So again, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg when we talk about honeybees and, and bumblebees. So we're gonna dive into the diversity of these bees, sweat bees, mining bees, digger bees, cuckoo bees, and, and things like that. There is a, a handful of different bee families. Uh, again, in Wisconsin, we've got about 500 or so species. In the US, we've got uh, over 3,500 species and worldwide, probably in the ballpark of 20,000 or so species of bees. So no matter where you were on the planet, Wisconsin or elsewhere, the pie chart is going to look somewhat similar. Honeybees, bumblebees are just kind of a small wedge of the pie. The rest of the diversity are these wild bee species, and most of those are solitary. Now, before I go any further, I do want to share a couple of resources with you. Now, first of all, if you wanted to learn about bees in general, this is going to be pretty much the bee Bible out there. So if you're a bee researcher, you're going to use this book but can you see how thick it is? Uh, this thing's like a, a big old telephone book. Uh, this is highly technical. I would not recommend that you buy this by any means. This covers bees of the entire world. Very, very technical information. However, there's a lot of really good books that have come out just in the last decade or so. And this one that I'm showing on the screen is one of my all-time favorites. I cannot recommend this book uh, enough. It's simply called The Bees of Your Backyard. It does cover all of North America, but they've got some really great range maps. Uh, and actually, if you think about bees in North America and in the U.S. in particular, the hot spot of bee diversity is actually the southwestern states, which may seem a little counterintuitive. You can have some very specialized species there nesting in the soil or in uh, hollow plant stems, things like that. So the southwestern states have a lot more bee species than we do here in Wisconsin. But again, this is a, a great resource. If I flip through it briefly, you can see it's loaded with color photographs describing the main groups of bees over 250 pages and not terribly expensive. I think it retails for around 30 bucks or so. It is written for uh, both the general audience. Uh, it does have some technical information though. So as a professional entomologist, I do rely on that book as a, a good resource for my day-to-day -day work, but I think it's uh, digestible by the general public as well. So if you just want one good book, to help identify and learn about some of the bees in your backyard, this one is a great resource. A few other ones as well from the same uh, authors, Olivia Carroll and, and Joseph Wilson. This one is relatively new. Uh, it's kind of a, a somewhat slimmed down version of the last one I showed you, and it's specific to Eastern North America, which does include uh, the upper Midwest, uh, whereas that last one talked about Western states as well. So this is a little bit more specific to our region. Uh, just like the last one, it does have some technical information, but still digestible for the general public and those just that have a general interest in learning about the bees around them. A little bit cheaper, I think it's about 27 or so is the, the suggested price on the back of the book. They also have essentially a, a Cliff Notes version. So you can go on to uh, Amazon or, or other booksellers and you can find this kind of a laminated cardstock version that you can fold out. And it has, I think, about 50 to 70 or so of the common bees. And we'll point out some of the key features for identifying some of those. So those are some great resources out there as well. One other one I want to mention, uh, many of you have maybe heard of Heather Holm. She has really written some awesome books in the last decade or so. Uh, this is uh, about bees of the Midwest and Great Lakes region. And what's a little bit different about this one is it focuses very heavily on the plants uh, that bees like to go to. So if you are hoping to put in specific plants to help out and attract certain types of bees, uh, this can be a really good book for that because they have sections that focus on identifying identifying the bees. They have other sections that focus on the plants, and then it'll tell you what bees might go to those plants. So this is a, a really cool book. Also retails for about 30 or so dollars. Uh, it does have technical information, but still very digestible for the general public uh, as well. So those are a couple of books that I wanted to share. Again, if, if you are interested in learning more about the bees around you beyond what I talk about today, I'd suggest maybe tracking down one of those books from your local library or uh, purchase them for your own library if you are a bibliophile.
like myself. Now, if you're looking for some free resources, I do want to highlight two as well. So this is the Wisconsin Bee Identification Guide. Uh, this is uh, an extension publication that myself and, and some colleagues, Christy Stewart and Christy Wen, uh, wrote about four or five years ago. And my talk today is essentially based on uh, this publication. So if you would like to get a copy of this for a future reference, uh, you can go to this link in that blue box on uh, this particular slide. So maybe take a picture or screenshot of that. It's a, a bit.ly link, a short code. So if you go to that page, you can download this as a free PDF. Otherwise, if you simply search for Wisconsin Bee Identification Guide, you should be able to find it online uh, pretty easily. I, I do have a version on my website, which is uh, a one page front and back uh, kind of condensed version. But uh, this version that you can find through the link is more of a booklet, um, which has a lot more color photographs in it as well. But that's a free resource. I encourage you all to track that down. It'll give you some basic information about uh, our bees in Wisconsin. And then one other free resource, uh, and again, this one you can also find online as a free PDF if you go to the link in that blue box right there. Um, this is a publication from the USDA Forest Service. It's about 40 pages long, and it really goes uh, into the details behind our, uh, the biology of our native and wild bees here in North America. Uh, and again, I'm going to be touching on many of these details today, but if you just want some additional uh, future reading, this is a, a fun publication to read. A lot of very cool artistic drawings of bees in there, uh, some good detailed information as well. So I'd encourage you all to check out that free resource online. Now, I do want to point out with bees, if you're trying to identify them in your own yard, they can be tough at times. And uh, this is coming from a professional entomologist whose main job is to identify bees. Bees can be challenging, especially to identify them to genus or species level. For many bees, you actually need to get a specimen under the microscope to be certain of that exact species in some cases. Often identifying them to family, uh, you can do from pictures, but I just wanna point out some of the features that we often need to look at to identify bees would be the size, the coloration, but also some details of the wing venation or the vein pattern. So if you look at the photo in the bottom right hand corner, there's these veins or the lines on the wings that make a series of basically closed cells, as we call them, this pattern of lines and little rectangular, triangular regions. And there's very subtle differences amongst different bee species in the number of cells, uh, how those veins are angled. Are they rounded? Are they straight? What kind of angles do they form between them? Are they very narrow? Are they wide angles? That sort of thing. And so that's a feature that we often need to see very well, and it's often hard to see in photographs. So don't be discouraged if you're having a hard time identifying bees. In my mind, in a lot of cases, you can't do it very well from photographs sometimes. Another feature that is in the more technical keys, but is hard to see it unless you have a specimen under the microscope, and even then it can be tricky to see, uh, antennal sutures. So basically imagine on the bee, um, they have, uh, it would basically be their upper lip. They're gonna have one little line or two little lines between their upper lip essentially and the base of the antennae. Well, if you look at this photo in the bottom left-hand corner, that bee has a very hairy fuzzy face. Uh, and so even if you had it under the microscope, you'd have to sit there with the bee on a pin and turn it very subtly under the microscope to try and see are there one lines or two. And again, that can be very difficult to do, if not impossible from pictures sometimes. There's also some clues we can gather from their behavior. Are they nesting in hollow plant stems or in the ground? And I'll talk more about those details a little bit. Sometimes the food plants they're going to. Some bees are generalist and will go to a wide range of flowers. Uh, other bees are pretty picky eaters. So they'll essentially go to a very narrow range of flowers, maybe a particular plant family, for example, or plant genus in some cases. There also can be clues about the seasonal pattern. We know that some of our bees can be active early in spring, and then they're done for the rest of the year. There's other bee species that may come out more in mid to late summer, and those can be clues we can use to help identify them in some situations. Now, a little bit about bee behavior and, and essentially what do they need to survive? It, it's somewhat similar to humans. They need food and shelter in a nutshell. Uh, their food is going to be pollen as a protein source and nectar is a liquid and carbohydrate source. 
bees can also go to water simply to gather uh, water and moisture that way, but they basically need that food, the pollen and nectar, which they're getting from flowers. Uh, and then they need shelter. And this is where bees start to really differ quite a bit in their behavior. We have many bees, about two thirds of all our bees are ground nesters, meaning that they make a little tunnel down in the ground. They might go down two, three inches. They may go down six inches. They may go down a foot. It differs for each bee species. But about two thirds of our bees are ground nesters. Uh, about a third of our bees are essentially tube nesters. They like pre-existing tubes or tunnels above ground. So that could be uh, an insect hole in a standing dead tree, maybe a beetle tunneled out. Uh, well, a bee might find that hole and use it as a nest in the future. It could be a hollow plant stem or a plant stem that we've pruned. And maybe the bees will tunnel out the pithy center in the middle of that stem. That's another common nesting site. Sometimes we can actually encourage bees by putting out a bee house or bee hotel where we have little cardstock tubes uh, and uh, leafcutter bees and, and mason bees will go to those. Those are essentially above ground tube nesters. And then we have a few bees that are cavity nesters. These are things like bumblebees and uh, occasionally we see feral honeybees where they uh, move off and they'll start a, a colony inside uh, a hollow tree out in the woods or maybe in a hollow void or walled void or cavity in a structure, soffit area, something like that. So again, some of these clues can be very useful for identifying the bees that we're dealing with. Now, one important thing to understand about bees with their behavior is we have differences if the bees are social or if they're solitary. And one important thing to know is almost all of our bees are solitary creatures, meaning they essentially live alone. There are, however, some social bees that we are very familiar with. These are the honeybees and, and bumblebees. So these live together as a colony, although the colony size and structure is going to differ from bee to bee. Some like honeybees can have big colonies with thousands, tens of thousands of, of workers present. Bumblebees, depending on the species they may have, 75 or 100 bees present in the colony. Some can have maybe a couple hundred, but again, there's some subtle differences there. Now, what's cool about uh, the social bees is you can actually start getting some differentiation in behavior within the colony, some specialization, if you will. You'll have a queen who stays put in the colony and she's laying eggs and that's her main role. Then you have workers. And for something like honeybees, you can have differences in worker behavior depending on their age. Some are in the nest caring for young, some are out going more dangerous uh, spots and doing foraging for food and resources, things like that. Then we've got our solitary bees. And as I said a moment ago, these essentially live uh, alone. They're kind of hermits, uh, if you will, but sometimes they can be, be gregarious, meaning you'll have a bunch of these in the same general area but they're each doing their own thing. So imagine you're going to the beach. Uh, you'll have a whole bunch of people on the beach, but everyone's on their own towel kind of doing their, their own thing. So it, it's kind of like that. With that said, uh, we don't have specialization because it's essentially one female bee. She's a hardworking single mom of the insect world. She's got to make her nest. She's got to gather all the resources to stash down in her nest so her young can grow and survive and develop on that. And in a lot of cases, these nests are going to be very small. We're talking maybe 8, 10, 12 eggs being laid. And essentially what these solitary bees do, they're gathering that pollen nectar, they stash it away, they provision these little rooms or cells, as we call them, inside their nest. So this photo at the bottom, that's inside a solitary bee nest. And you can see in this particular bee, they've used soil or dirt to basically wall off these little cells. So inside those little cells, are it's like a, a prepper bunker, if you will. There's all the food that that bee is gonna need to develop to the adult stage. So when we look in those cells, we see a big wad of pollen and, and plant materials wadded together. And then the little jelly bean structure, that's an egg. So that egg is gonna hatch. The bee larva is then going to live in there as it's growing and developing, and it's gonna consume that food source. Eventually when they mature and turn into adult bees, they're gonna exit out the tube and go do their thing that way. So I mentioned earlier that bees evolve from certain types of wasps. Those same wasps do the same kind of thing. It's just down in the ground. And instead of pollen and nectar, they are provisioning those cells with insect prey. It might be leaf hoppers, sometimes spiders or some of those wasps and, and so on. But again, these solitary bees are all doing this. Some do it above ground in, in hollow tubes, like hollow plant stems. Two thirds of our species are doing this down in the ground in a little soil tunnel. Let's talk a little bit more about social bees. So there's two main types 
uh, we see in Wisconsin, honeybees and bumblebees, we're all generally familiar with those. I will also point out there are certain sweat bees that will sometimes refer to them as being primitively social. You may have eight, 10, 12 females living together using kind of the same tunnel entrance. Um, so it, it's slightly social, but they don't have the big developed colonies like bumblebees and, and honeybees do, at least not in uh, our area here in Wisconsin. I also want to point out that there are many insects that are sometimes mistaken for bees. So when it comes to August and September at the Insect Diagnostic Lab, I start getting all these calls and emails. Hey, I went out, I mowed my lawn, I got stung by angry bees. Well, if you have a social insect living in the ground that came out and stung you, there's really only two possibilities. If it's a bee, it's going to have to be a bumblebee. And most folks are going to recognize bumblebees. They tend to be pretty big, robust, black and hairy. In the vast majority of cases, when folks say they got stung by a bee, it's probably actually a ground nesting wasp, a type of yellow jacket. So that's what we see in this bottom right hand corner. So keep that in mind. Usually when folks are getting stung by quote unquote ground bees, they're actually yellow jackets, but that can end up giving bees a bad rap because folks are getting stung. It's by yellow jackets. They blame bees though. But in the vast majority of these ground nesting bees, they're very, very docile creatures. I'll expand upon that in a couple of minutes as well. So let's talk about the honeybee. Uh, ironically, uh, this is our state insect here in Wisconsin, but it is not native to Wisconsin or the US for that matter. So they are very important agriculturally. They are a state insect, but not native here uh, to our country uh, whatsoever. And this is our only bee that truly makes honey. Uh, some of the bumblebees and other bees do collect nectar. They make a, a honey-like substance, but it's such a small quantity, we can't harvest it. So when we're talking honey that we harvest as humans to eat and enjoy. We're really talking about the honeybee right here. And again, these are social insects. They can have big colonies. In most cases, they are in managed hives where you can have thousands, tens of thousands of workers present. You will have the queen who's kind of running the show around there. So you do have specialization. The queen is laying eggs and, and doing some other things to kind of manage the colony. Then you've got workers who differ by age. Younger workers are usually playing a role in the hive when they get older and they're more expendable they go out and do the more dangerous work of foraging for food and other resources. Also, what's unique about honeybees for our Wisconsin bees is they overwinter together as a colony. Basically, from a honeybee point of view, they're gathering enough resources to make honey so that they have this fuel storage in their colony. During the winter months, they're consuming that fuel to get energy. And then they basically, within the hive, they contract into a smaller and smaller ball, depending on temperature. If it's really cold, they get small, they sit there, they huddle together, they actually generate heat and they will maintain a constant temperature within the hive. So it could be 20 below outside, it's gonna be much, much warmer inside that honeybee hive. And they can actually circulate. The ones in the middle of the ball might get too warm, they'll go to the outside and, and so on. So they're living together as a colony all year, they're staying active, they're consuming that honey throughout the winter months and going through food. And again, these are generally raised by beekeepers. We do occasionally get feral colonies where they'll go out, they'll get into a hollow tree. We see that on the left-hand picture there, but in most cases, again, they're gonna be maintained hives. Bumblebees are our other social type of bee. We've got over two dozen species documented from Wisconsin and maybe about 10 to 12 species that we see with uh, some regularity here uh, in the state. Uh, these are, of course, social bees, so they live together as a colony, but colonies are generally going to be small, maybe 100 or fewer workers present. It depends on the exact bumblebee species. And in general, these are cavity nesters. They like to go to pre-existing small cavities. So that could be a chipmunk burrow in the ground Around, maybe a hollow space, little cavity amongst roots uh, at the base of a tree or hollow space kind of in a compost pile or a pile of grass clippings or something like that. Uh, occasionally, they'll get into man-made objects like a birdhouse. Doesn't happen that often, but I do get cases every once in a while. Uh, also, the behavior varies by species. I'm going to talk later on about bees we call cuckoo bees. These are bees that trick other bees into doing the hard work. We have some bumblebees that are cuckoo bees. So they'll specifically track down a different bumblebee species. When the female's out foraging, they're going to sneak in, lay eggs, and then leave. And they trick that other bee into raising their young. So those are cuckoo bumblebees. Uh, we have a number of species out there uh, as well. 
What's neat about uh, bumblebees, they can have long flight periods. They can actually do something called buzz pollination. They basically uncouple their wings from their flight muscles. So they can sit there and, and, and vibrate, but they're not really flapping their wings and flying. But that can be really good for pollination. Certain plants don't release their pollen very readily. And so by vibrating like an electric toothbrush, the pollen can kind of fall off and be released more easily. But they can also do that to generate some heat. So bumblebees can be active at pretty cool temperatures in spring, sometimes late into the fall uh, as well. But one interesting thing about bumblebees is they have annual colonies. So they don't live together as a colony all winter like honeybees. They naturally will die out in the fall, except for certain females that will be the new queens. Those leave and find a sheltered spot like mulch area or amongst leaves. They hibernate, they spend the winter. The following spring, those queens have to try and start new nests. That's a little bit different. So where do they live? As I said, they're colony nesters. They like pre-existing chipmunk burrows and things like that. That's what we see on the left. Um, sometimes these can be hard to notice. A couple of years back, I had one in the side yard of, of my home yard. Uh, the actual hole was about the size of my thumb. I didn't notice the nest until about August that year. I simply let them be and I didn't mow that area the rest of the summer. They were gone the next year, but that's the type of habitat that they like. Now, many folks have not seen the inside of a bumblebee nest. And the analogy I make is there's that old TV show, The Odd Couple. You had the kind of the, the neat, tidy freak and then the, the slob. Uh, honeybees would be kind of the neat and tidy one. And then bumblebees would be kind of the messier one. So this is the inside of a bumblebee nest here on the right-hand picture. You can see it's just kind of this jumbly mess of these little waxen cells. Uh, and they're raising young in there. They're storing food in there uh, as well. So it seems fairly disorganized, again, compared to uh, a honeybee nest. If you want to get to know more about uh, bumblebees in Wisconsin, uh, yesterday on the, the webinar uh, for Pollinator Week, uh, Claudio Gratton was talking uh, with one of his colleagues, Hannah Gaines, and uh, Claudio had a student, uh, Dr. Jeremy Hemberger, who did his PhD work on bumblebees, develop some really great uh, uh, information and a website on Wisconsin bumblebees, which is down in that blue box. Otherwise, if you simply do a Google search for Wisconsin bumblebees and put like UW-Madison, you'll be able to find it. They've got some cool guides for identifying bumblebees, learn more about their life cycle and biology, uh, but there's some great resources available out there from my colleagues. Now let's switch to solitary bees. So I said social bees, that's a slim wedge of the pie. Everybody else would be solitary bees. So this is where the bulk of our bee diversity is. Most bees in the state and the U.S. and the world uh, would belong to the solitary bee group. As I said earlier, these are hardworking single moms. The female has to make the nest. She's got to gather nesting materials in some cases that may be bits of leaves or leaf cutter ants or soil for mason bees or other materials. And then she's got to gather all the food supplies to stash away in those little cells for her young to develop. As I mentioned, uh, they differ by where they live. About two thirds of our bees nest in the ground, a little tunnel. About a third of them nest above ground in hollow tubes. It could be a hollow plant stem or something similar. Now compared to honeybees, these bees tend to be much pickier when it comes to eating. They may go to specific types of plants, maybe a single plant genus, single plant family. They're usually not going to everything under the sun. What that means though, in terms of how good they are as pollinators, if they specialize on a certain type of plant, they tend to be really good. So there's been some papers that have looked at creatures such as mason bees, Certain mason bees are great to have in orchard settings because pound for pound, they're much better at pollinating than honeybees. They could have maybe one bee do the work of about 10 honeybees or so. So they really are pound for pound good pollinators. And also what's cool about these solitary bees, they do not have a colony of relatives to defend. So they are surprisingly docile. So remember earlier I said folks get stung by ground bees, which are almost always ground nesting yellow jackets. Most of these nest in the ground. They are true ground bees, but they are exceedingly docile. So here's an example. This is UW-Madison campus up on uh, Observatory Hill, uh, kind of by Memorial Union, if you know where that is. And uh, I know there's a lot going on here, but what I want you to pay attention to in this clip, just look at all the little spots moving back and forth. This was about late April, probably five, six years ago, a nice warm spring day. Uh, there, there are tens of thousands of solitary bees flying around. These bees came out, they were active for about two to three three weeks, then they're done for the year. You won't see them until the following year. So I went and sat there amongst these bees and read a book with tens of thousands of ground bees 
How many times was I stung? Zero, because they're very, very docile creatures. So if you got up close and looked at their nest, it's going to look like an anthill, but there's going to be one bee that lives there. That is her home. And again, she's got to make that home. She's got to gather all the resources, stash down in that nest to feed to her young. And again, just to show you how docile they are. So here I am. Uh, this is in a park near my home in Middleton. So I am there for uh, a size reference. You can see to the uh, left of me in the picture, there's what appear to be anthills. Those are nests from these solitary ground nesting bees. So these are so darn solitary uh, and uh, docile. You can get up close. You can look at them. You can even kind of pick them up in your hand or I've pet them with my finger. They have very little interest in you. Very, very docile, not aggressive whatsoever. Oops. Sorry about that. PowerPoint got a little jumpy there. All right, so let's go on a survey of some of these solitary bees. And this is one you've probably all heard of. These are sweat bees. Get the name because they often like to land and, and kind of lap up uh, salts from our sweat, uh, hence the name of, of sweat bees. For our wild solitary bees, these ones are fairly easy to identify because a lot of the species have a metallic greenish color. Um, usually they are metallic green like the upper right hand picture. On some uh, genera, the males will have kind of a Green Bay Packer color, green with some yellow stripes and, and black stripes on the abdomen. So we've got a bunch of species in the state. Um, these tend to be quite Quite common. I've seen plenty of them recently. Um, a lot of them will nest uh, in the ground. Uh, so ground nesting, soil nesting. Uh, a few of them will live in hollow logs. So if you have a, a down tree in your yard with insect holes in it, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That can provide habitat for some of these insects. Uh, most of them are going to be truly solitary. A few can be kind of primitively social, meaning they may share a nest entrance and things like that. But again, it doesn't have the social structure like honeybees or bumblebees. So that's one common example of solitary bees here in the state. The uh, the little video clip I showed you a couple of minutes ago uh, from UW Madison campus, those were mining bees. So there are many species of mining bees that are active in spring. They're some of our first bees to come out. They are ground nesting solitary species. Again, their nests look like little anthills on the ground with one hole and, and one bee lives in there. A lot of these can be hard to identify to species because you need to get them under the microscope. But again, these can be very, very common, especially in spring. Some of the other species can be active later times of the year. But again, and if you see solitary ground nesting bees in spring, there's a good chance it could be one of these mining bees from the genus Andrina. If it's not that, it may be this type of bee called a cellophane bee. Has very similar behavior to some of the sweat bees and those mining bees. They dig a little tube nest down in the ground, uh, but these get the name of cellophane bee because they actually secrete a, a waxy substance to line their nest tube with. That's going to help regulate the microclimate. They have some glands on their body to secrete this substance, and that's what we can see in this bottom right-hand picture. There's that cellophane or plasticky material. They secreted that, hence the name of cellophane bee. So these can also be very common uh, in spring around the same time as some of our uh, mining bees. And again, another example of solid ground nesting bees, very, very docile creatures, but very beneficial creatures uh, as well. Later on in the year, we see some of our longhorn bees, which get the name because the males, like shown in the upper left-hand corner, can have these very, very long antennae, hence the name of, of longhorn bees. It's the genus Melisodes and, and some closely related ones as well. We have one very common species, which I'm showing down here in the bottom left-hand corner. This is the two-spotted longhorn bee, and these can be decent size. They might be a half inch, sometimes three quarters of an inch or so, and uh, when folks contact me about these, they'll sometimes mix them up with either carpenter bees or certain bumblebees because they are a little bit larger. But this is a, a common type of longhorn bee. And a distinguishing feature for these is at the tip of the abdomen, there's going to be two little white spots, one on each side. It looks like a little minus sign or a dash mark. That's a distinguishing feature for this species, otherwise almost entirely black. These are also solitary ground nesters, so they like bare, uh, sunny uh, soil. 
uh, and they tend to be fond of plants from the sunflower family. Uh, I see these in my own yard going to my wife's zinnias and, and related plants, uh, some of our sunflowers and things like that. These tend to be active a little bit later in the year, though, usually like July and August and into September. That's when I'm seeing some of these species like the two spotted longhorn bees. So again, the time of the year, the seasonality can be a clue to help us figure out what bees we're seeing in our own yard. If you have a vegetable garden, you're growing pumpkins and squash and related things, you might have some of these bees around. These are squash bees, and they look somewhat similar to honeybees, but they are very specialized in going to flowers from the cucurbit group. Um, and what they'll do is they'll nest in the ground, but they go fairly deep, maybe about a, a foot or so below ground. Um, and they usually aren't traveling terribly far. So they can nest in the same garden spot where you've got those pumpkins or squash growing. Uh, so they very much specialize in those crops, can be really good pollinator though. So squash pumpkins and other cucurbits. And one thing that's uh, cool, but also kind of cute about these is uh, the male bees. And, and in general, male bees don't do a whole lot. Uh, they contribute sperm when they mate. And then they kind of go off and do their own thing. They may die a short while later. They may just kind of hang out and, and not do much. Well, for these squash bees, the males will actually go inside flowers and they'll just literally take a nap. They will literally sleep inside the flowers. So if you ever open up a, a squash flower and there's bees in there, it's probably some of these male squash bees taking a nap. Meanwhile, the females are doing all the hard work uh, gathering resources to provision that nest down in the soil. But another example of a solitary, very docile ground nesting species. And again, about two thirds of all our bee species in the state are ground nesters. Now I'm switching to talk about some bees that nest above ground in hollow tubes. And, and these are carpenter bees, which aren't very common in Wisconsin. We see them in about the southeast corner of the state. Uh, so Milwaukee, Waukesha area, that's usually where I see them. I have had reports from Dane, Rock, Sauk counties as well. Not very common though, compared to if you go to the south of us, go to a place like Lexington, in Kentucky in late April, you'll see these all over the place. Now, these carpenter bees look a lot like bumblebees, about the same size. They're large, they're robust, pretty hairy. A key distinctive feature, though, and this we can see very easily in the bottom left-hand picture, that abdomen is kind of jet black and shiny. If this were a bumblebee, the abdomen would be hairy and usually some yellow stripes in there. So on carpenter bees, that abdomen, very shiny, glossy, not a whole lot of hair present on. So that's a way to differentiate these from bumblebees. So what these bees do, they get the name of carpenter bee because they tunnel into soft wood like pine or cedar, something like that. Uh, they go in about an inch, they make a 90 degree turn, and then they tunnel perpendicular to that. And so that's what we see in this upper right hand picture. You can see that tunnel going to the right. So that female would provision these little cells and then she's walling it off with bits of chewed up uh, wood material. So it's the same general procedure, but again, some bees do it in the soil, some bees do it uh, above ground in hollow tubes that they are finding or creating in this case. So we only have one species in our area. Again, they can be maybe a little bit of a pest sometimes because they can tunnel into your wooden gazebo or fence and, and things like that, but generally not much of a real issue. Uh, one other cool thing about these, you can identify the males very easily because they have a big white patch right on the front of the face. That's what we see in the upper left-hand picture. So several years ago, uh, I went down with my wife to a horse show in, in uh, Lexington area in late April. I was wandering around this old town of, of Paris, Kentucky, looking for these and uh, found a male, which I knew was a male because that white patch, the female doesn't have it. So you can pick her, uh, pick him up and you know he can't hurt you because he's a male. Only female bees have the stinger because it, uh, it evolved from an egg length structure. So male bees are harmless. Um, he can sometimes though fly around a nest, he'll kind of bluff charge you, try and chase you off, but he is uh, he's harmless. It's all bark, no bite, so to speak but a cool example of a tube nesting bee. Then we've got some other ones you've maybe heard of like leaf cutting bees. These will nest inside hollow plant stems or other pre-existing tubes. What's unique about them is they chew off little bits of leaf material. They take that back to their nest and then they roll it up and line the nest with it and they'll chew it up and things like that. So that's how they're walling off and provisioning these cells. They use leaf material to do it, but it's the same general process, just a slight variation of it. Many of the species will have pretty prominent mandibles and they're fun to watch. Um, if you ever look at a plant in your yard and you see these perfect circular or semicircular notches out of the end edges of leaves, 
that means you got leaf cutter bees around. They cause a trivial amount of damage. You don't need to do anything about it. I see it every year on my rose bushes. I've seen it on red buds and a number of other plants. I just kind of shrug my shoulders and say, cool, I've got leaf cutter bees in my yard. Again, not really a plant pest at all. But uh, the female uses her mandibles or mouth parts just like scissors, snip, 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 snip. She cuts off this uh, round disc of leaf. She will then fly that back to the nest, line her nest with that. She's gathering pollen, she's gathering nectar, she's provisioning the nest. That's how she goes about doing her thing. This is a, a bee that we can actually encourage with nesting boxes, bee boxes, if you will. I'll talk more about that coming up in a couple minutes. And one unique thing about these bees, so a lot of bees are collecting pollen on their legs. They'll have very hairy patches on their legs where pollen can get combed into it. With these bees, they basically have a, a fuzzy belly, if you will. They have a whole bunch of hair-like structures on the underside of the abdomen, and that's fairly unique for them. So we can see that very well in the bottom right-hand picture. All that yellow pollen is stuck to the underside of the abdomen. If you see that a bee with pollen on the abdomen that's a very strong clue that it's a leaf cutter bee because that's pretty unique for those so that's a feature to identify these out in the field but again if you see a female cutting off leaf material that's going to be a leaf cutter bee very beneficial uh, as are mason bees so mason bees nest in a lot of the same habitats are very similar to the leaf cutter bees except the females use soil so having a little patch of bare soil in your yard is not a bad thing because the females gather that they go to that tube, they line the tube with the soil, and then they use soil to wall it off. Hence the name of mason bees. That's what we see in this bottom right hand photo. Often these have kind of a somewhat metallic -y blue or greenish color. You go to the tropics, there's some cool looking ones that are like red and orange and yellow and green and purple. Ours here in Wisconsin tends to be pretty fuzzy and with yellowish hairs, but underneath that is often a metallic kind of turquoise-ish uh, color. So that's what they look like. These can be great pollinators of some of our fruit trees, like apple trees. I see them every spring at my uh, crab apple tree uh, in my front yard. And they're also above ground tube nesters, so hollow plant stems. And again, they're provisioning uh, the nest and then walling it off little cells with little bits of soil. So these can be really good pollinators. And pound for pound, I mentioned these earlier, they can be better than honeybees in orchard settings. There are bees called mast bees, which the cool thing to know about these, they use the kind of chipmunk method to gather pollen. Look at them, uh, they look kind of wasp-like. Um, they don't have a very hairy appearance. So what they do is they gather pollen, they shove it in their mouth, and that's how they carry it back to their nest. So these are, are pretty distinctive with a wasp-like appearance. They often have um, alternating uh, a black and yellow on the face, but also on the legs. So that can be a way to help identify these. They're going to uh, above ground tubes. It could be a hollow plant stem or something similar, but these can be fairly common uh, as well. Bunch of species in our area. Uh, another above ground uh, tube or cavity nester, carter bees, sometimes called wool carter bees, because they like to gather wool-like material. What they'll do is they'll go to plant leaves and scrape off the trichomes or little plant hairs. They take that back to their nest and they kind of line their nest with it. These will go to hollow plant stems, but sometimes these go to grooves around edges of windows. So if you ever open up your window and you see this cottony fluffy stuff in there somewhere on the outside of the window, that may be from some of these carter bees. They're very docile, but they do have a somewhat wasp-like appearance with the black and yellow stripes on the abdomen. Uh, the males can also be a little bit territorial. It's all bark, no bite. They may bluff charge you, but uh, they can't sting you or anything like that. Uh, these can be somewhat common. I usually see them in my own yard, especially if I have the plant called lamb's ears out there, which is very soft and velvety. You can see in this video clip, um, the bee is sitting there using her mouth parts to scrape off those trichomes or plants plant hairs. Again, she's going to take that back to the nest and use that to line the nest. So it's the same general procedure as many of the other bees I've talked about, just a, a different kind of building material, if you will. And then uh, another type of tube nesting one, small carpenter bees. These are fairly nondescript, usually quite small compared to many of our bees, a metallic greenish color. Um, but uh, I see these all over the place once you recognize them. They're really fond of pruned plant stems. You might prune your roses or I've seen them on honeysuckle and, and other shrubs as well. And what they'll do is they'll go to the, the flush cut on those pruned uh, shrubs. And if there is a pithy center that they can tunnel out easily, 
they'll dig down into that maybe two, three inches. That's what they use as their nesting site. So these can be very, very common. Uh, once they have that nest established, they're going to go forage or pollen and nectar, bring it back. And these usually go to a pretty wide range of flowers as well. But uh, another example of a common solitary bee. And then I mentioned these earlier, the cuckoo bees. We have a whole bunch. I mentioned some uh, cuckoo bumblebees, like in the bottom right-hand corner, we have a number of cuckoo bumblebee species. We have a number of other cuckoo bees as well from slightly different groups. Uh, and many of these do have a very wasp-like appearance. And, and I bet if I showed, uh, you know, walk down the sidewalk and showed folks pictures of these and asked, is it a bee or wasp? Pretty much in every case, they're going to say that's a wasp. I mean, look at the photo in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, the bottom center photo, very wasp-like in appearance. Uh, and if you think about it from an evolutionary sense, these bees are sneaking into the nest of another bee and getting that female to raise her young. So they don't need to do the hard work of gathering pollen and nectar to feed their young because they're tricking someone else into doing it. So as a result, they often are not covered with a whole lot of hairs because they don't need to gather that pollen. So I mentioned earlier, we have bees that look wasp-like. There's also some wasps that can look rather bee-like as well. Um, these are somewhat common, but again, in a lot of cases, folks probably don't recognize them as bees. They probably think it's the type of wasp that they're seeing out in their yard. And usually these have very specific associations. You'll have a type of cuckoo bee that is specifically linked Link to a very specific type of other bee that's doing the work. So um, they have these close-knit relationships with some other bee species. And then to wrap things up, because um, we're getting towards the end of today's uh, webinar period, I just want to share a couple brief things about how you can help out bees and other pollinators in your yard, um, because I already went on a survey. I know on Monday of this week, Susan Carpenter had some great information about plants to put in your yard. I know later this week, you're going to hear more about pesticides, so I'm not going to go into that in great deal detail, but three simple things you can do in your yard to help out the bees that I just uh, showed you all about, and these would be increasing plant diversity, providing resources such as uh, nesting habitats for some of those tube nesting bees or the ground nesting bees as well, and also can we reduce or eliminate pesticide use in your yard. Those are some ways to help out. So just to touch briefly on plant diversity, in general, the more diversity in plants you have in your yard and in the landscape around you, you'll have a greater diversity of insects. Ideally, if you can have three or more plants blooming at any given point in time, that's great because you'll have different plant families perhaps providing different resources. And if we have uh, flowers blooming at different times of the year, we are offering food throughout the season. Because remember, some of the bees I mentioned are active in spring and only in spring. Some of the other ones are active later in the year. Ideally, try and go with native plants. I simply say that because a lot of our bees are native to our area. Most of our bees are native to our area, and they have evolved specifically with our native plants for long periods of time. So that can be helpful. I'm not completely against uh, non-native plants, but one thing to avoid and to look for at the garden center would be plants, uh, maybe cultivars that are double flowered. These have been bred to be very catchy to the human eye. Lots of petals, very dense, cool looking flowers. But it turns out those double flowered plants might actually have very little or no pollen or nectar available. So we think we're providing resources for bees, but we're really not. So keep that in mind. And also just kind of a question to pose to everyone. Can we tolerate weeds? We've heard a lot this year, especially about no mow may, the idea of allowing the dandelions, the clover to go in your lawn. To us, we might think of those as weeds sometimes, but to bees and other pollinators, that can be breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That can be resources that they need to provision their nests for their young. So that can really help out. So I think we need to uh, kind of consider changing our perception of what's a weed and, and what do we really need for a lawn in our yard. Some other things we can do, we can put out nesting habitat. Uh, again, two thirds of our solitary bees are ground nesters. So if you have a bare patch of sandyish soil in a sunny spot, that's great. You don't necessarily have to cover that with mulch. That can provide some nesting habitat for some of these bee species. Otherwise, you could put out some hollow tubes. Uh, this could be uh, bamboo, it could be cardstock. Again, I talked about many species that like to nest above ground. If you go online, you can search for bee hotels and get kits to do this. And in a nutshell, they're just hollow tubes that we're putting out. Personally, I like the idea of the cardstock tubes. Uh, they do have some that are bamboo tubes. 
I think there needs to be more research done on the topic. But one reason I, I like to suggest the cardstock tubes is you can replace those every single year. With the bamboo tubes in bee houses or bee hotels, if those are reused from year to year, there's a chance that if the bee had a disease or a parasite, those might remain in those tubes. And so a new bee coming in this year could be impacted by a pathogen or parasite from last year or two, three years ago. So if you're replacing the cardstock ones every year, that could be a way to help minimize impacts like that. But also you could think about garden cleanup. Can we leave those plant stems in your yard? Because again, things like uh, small carpenter bees shown here in that bottom right-hand photo, they like to nest in those pithy stems. So you don't necessarily need to go scorched earth and cut everything down because those uh, standing plants can provide a habitat for some of the bees that I discussed today. And then when it comes to pesticides, I know I've got a lot on the slides, but if possible, avoid pesticides entirely. That includes insecticides, but also things like herbicides that are taking out some of those plants that might be resources. And also we're finding more and more about some of these pesticides having sublethal kind of uh, small impacts that might add up and mean bad things for bees in general. In some cases, we can consider non-chemical management approaches, handpicking, squishing, using floating row covers or netting, things like that. Uh, that can be a helpful way uh, to uh, deal with certain pests using mulch to suppress weeds. You don't have to use herbicides. That could be something to consider uh, as well. If you do need to use a pesticide, make sure you have a really good reason for doing it. And in a nutshell, make sure you read and follow all those directions so we can minimize uh, potential non-target impacts and use a special caution if you are using any sort of systemic product or anything near flowers in general, even if it drifts onto flowers, that could mean bad things for bees and other pollinators. And then two other things related to pesticides to touch on, um, make sure you're getting plants from reliable sources. If you go to a plant nursery or a local garden center, often those folks are going to be very knowledgeable about those plants because they've either grown them themselves or they work very closely with the soil and they're going to have a good idea of how those plants have been treated versus if you go to a big box store, you may ask the, the employee at the big box store, but they don't know what was applied to the plants in a greenhouse in Florida before they were shipped up here. In the greenhouse industry, sometimes systemic products like neonicotinoids are used. So you can look for uh, container tags or stakes like this on the right-hand photo. Um, that might be something to steer clear of because if they were treated with the systemic product, especially if it were applied to the soil, there could be concerns for bees and other pollinators. And then one final thing, uh, there's a, a really critical need for research on some of the treatments like mosquito yard treatments. There's a few studies out there I've seen that looked at these type of treatments, one with monarch butterflies that found uh, the mosquito yard treatments could harm monarchs even like three or so weeks after treatment date. So they can have some long lasting impact. So if you care about bees and other pollinators and things like fireflies and butterflies that land on plants, avoid those yard treatments if you can, because we know they can have some risks uh, to uh, pollinators. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today, learning a little bit about uh, the bees around us. Again, I shared some uh, great resources. And uh, with that, Julie, I'll turn it over for any uh, questions here in the last couple of minutes. Uh, hey, PJ, uh, we have a lot of questions. Okay. So I, I hope you have till like eight o'clock or so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, starting from the top, uh, Margaret Goldich, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that last name right, wants to know what to put in a bug hotel. I'm assuming she means bee hotels to attract bees. I did do a quick search and, and brought up a couple of uh, pamphlets or online info from uh, Michigan State Extension and University of Minnesota, but I also said I'd let you weigh in on this. So is there something to put in those to attract the bees? I'm assuming she means besides putting in the actual tubes, but... Yeah, good question. So nothing you really need to put in there. You, you don't have to put in, you know, nectar, sugar source, or anything like that, what we're really doing is giving them a convenient nesting site so they don't have to spend as much time looking for hollow plant stems. Um, once they have that nesting site, they're going to go out and they're going to forage on their own. So 
really in my mind, nothing you need to add other than putting some tubes in there. And I, I mentioned briefly, I, I'm a fan of the cardstock tubes, um, but uh, any type of tube can uh, potentially work. Um, as you mentioned, Steve, there are some really good uh, publications. I've seen some from uh, Michigan State, which I know you shared in the chat or, or Julie did. Uh, I think I've also seen a good one from University of Maine, I wanna say, but uh, Michigan State is one that I often share if I get questions about bee houses and bee hotels. Okay, um, Holly Walker, uh, noted that uh, she seems to recall that sweat bees do tend to sting, which is something like I feel like I've been stung by sweat bees too, although not the same reaction as like from a wasp or a honeybee or something. But Right. I mean, for the most part, any of the bees I talked about today could potentially sting. Um, in some cases, it, it may be defensive. Like if you had one on your skin and it got, you know, under the edge of your shirt and it's getting squished a little bit or something, it may sting defensively. Um, for the sweat bees, uh, I did say that in some cases they can be kind of primitively social, where they may be sharing a loose kind of limited social uh, organization. In cases like that, they may be a little bit more likely to sting. I bumped into uh, and handled sweat bees plenty of, of times. I think I've maybe only been stung once or twice in my life. Um, and as far as stings go, it's really pretty minor. It kind of go, uh, you know, brush the bee off and, and that seems to often be about it. So um, it, it does seem to be a pretty mild sting, but uh, plenty of cases where uh, those species are going to be entirely solitary and very, very unlikely to sting. Uh, good question, I thought, from Jane Martin. Uh, it's something I was thinking of too when you showed that picture of the uh, uh, solitary bee mounds that look like anthills. She asks, well, is it easy to tell if it's a solitary bee? nest or an anthill. Uh, she has many large anthills and numerous smaller nests. Yeah, so this time of the year, there's a good chance I would say it's going to be an anthill. Uh, certain times of the year, we will see a just a flurry of activity. Um, and if you're in a spot where the soil texture is right for some of these ground nesting solitary bees, I mean, you're going to have like thousands of them in your lawn. Um, some good news, like if you're not particularly keen about that. Um, sometimes I get questions from the public saying, what can I do to get rid of these? And I say, just hold tight. Two weeks, they're going to be gone for the most part. So they're active very short period of time. Um, so usually if they're active, you're just going to notice a flurry of activity. If you got close to the nest, again, you're not going to be seeing ants coming in and out. It's going to be individual bees coming and going from those holes. So in my mind, fairly easy to, uh, to separate them. But uh, those mounds from some of the solitary ground bees can look very similar to uh, ant nests, but uh, it, it has to do with uh, a single bee coming in and out and also time of the year is a big clue. So like uh, mid-April uh, to mid-May, uh, that time of the year, we often see lots of activity from uh, some of the bees I mentioned, like cellophane bees and, and mining bees in particular. Some of them can be active later in the season as well, though. Uh Another one from Jane Martin, actually not a question, but an observation. She says she's, uh, she has carpenter bees in uh, Berlin, which is west of Oshkosh, which just say Oshkosh is my hometown. So uh, anyway, uh, cool. I don't know if I've ever actually identified a carpenter bee, but cool observation. Yeah, I'd say, it, you know, it doesn't surprise me too much to hear that. Uh, I do wonder, um, over time, if we will see more and more of those in the state, if we start getting milder winters with changing climate, for example, uh, I would expect to see them push northwards in the state uh, and, and kind of shoot up the eastern side of Wisconsin along Lake Michigan up towards Green Bay and, and probably Door County as well before pushing more uh, uh, northwards and westwards, you know, towards central Wisconsin and so on. But it doesn't surprise me too much. Um, as I said earlier, most of my reports are like Milwaukee, Waukesha area, but uh, we probably have some sort of records from uh, Oshkosh area as well would be my suspicion. Uh, Brenda Dolfers shared a, a good, uh, well, maybe technique for distinguishing carpenter bees and bumblebees. Uh, 
She says, carpenter bees have shiny butts, bumblebees have fuzzy butts. <laughs> yes, yes. And also if you have a, uh, a bumblebee nest, again, those are social. So if you had uh, a bumblebee nest, uh, it's not gonna be in a wood tunnel that they made. Uh, they're generally gonna be in the ground, generally hairy, robust. So yeah, the, the kind of glossy, shiny abdomen helps identify carpenter bees, but also the fact that they're nesting in wood would be a helpful clue as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone, uh, Connie Wilsnap asked if ants have wings. Now, I did dig into my entomology background and answer that one, but you can tell me if you have anything to add. I said, well, many ants have wings when it's mating time. Uh, the colony will produce new queens, they'll produce male drones. Uh, they fly up into the air, and I've, I've seen them massive numbers. Somehow, all the colonies in a huge area seem to know when to fly out at the same time. And anyway, what they're doing is they fly up in the air, they mate, the males unfortunately die, the, uh, well, maybe unfortunately for them, and the, the new queens will then try to found a new colony. But anything to did I miss anything? <laughs> no, I, I think that was basically uh, spot on. Uh, one small thing to add, there are some types of ants that uh, just don't uh, produce wing forms, but otherwise the vast majority of our ants, as you said, Steve, will produce winged individuals at certain points in the life cycle of the colony. Those leave and mate, that's how they form new colonies. Okay. Uh, Connie also asked if, uh, how do you tell Egg nests of bees from those of ants. Not sure what egg nests are, but unless you just meant the ground nests, which we kind of answered before. Yeah. Yeah, I would simply take a close look. Um, if it's ants, there's usually going to be workers around um, versus if it's bees, you're usually going to see them coming and going, but it's going to be an individual coming from, from one nest. Uh, Brenda Dolphers asked, uh, isn't there a wasp that makes that type of nest? And I forgot when this came in, uh, behind my window screens with grass. I think maybe that was when the Carter, uh, oh, Julie would like to chime in on this. <laughs> no, but I was just marking that it was completed. Yep. So uh, the, the grass behind the windows, um, there is a type of wasp actually called a grass carrying wasp is the common name for it. It's the genus Isodontia. And uh, they have behavior somewhat like the bees I talked about today. They're these solitary nesters. They like pre-existing tubes that are a little bit larger than some of the bees. And so for whatever reason, the way that our windows are designed um, on our homes, things like casement, crake out windows, and so yeah, there's often a groove they can get into and they will line the nest with bits of grass. And then they actually go and hunt tree crickets. That's what they provision their nest with. So often uh, if you open your window, you might have this uh, little strip or pile of grass that tumbles out. If you were to dig through that, there's usually some tree crickets in there, little usually uh, pale kind of greenish slender creatures. And that would be from one of these grass nesting wasps. Also uh, quite docile because they're solitary creatures. Uh, Jen Groves uh, uh, posed this question. Is it true that, that large bee hotels can make it easier for pathogens to spread, spread among the inhabitants? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I've seen a topic or a research uh, paper specifically on that topic for large bee hotels. And, you know, you also have to look at like, what's the definition of, of large as far as a bee hotel goes. Um, as I mentioned, we do have some concerns about uh, pathogens in things like bee hotels, because you are kind of uh, it's a little bit unnatural to concentrate the bees into a, a smaller area like that versus if they were just nesting in plant stems, they're going to be separated a lot more, for example. Um, and that's why I'd mentioned perhaps using those cardstock tubes. So we have fresh tubes in there every year. Now, keep in mind when they go into those tubes, they're usually walling it off with soil for mason bees, leaf material for leaf cutter bees or, or something else. And so that would help kind of contain because each of the females will be able to recognize which nest she was going into using various cues. So uh, I'm not aware of any uh, particular concerns, not that there might not be some. Uh, I think there's a little bit more research that is done, but I think there are steps we could take to reduce the chances of that by using replaceable cardstock tubes. Okay, we're going to try to wrap it up here. Uh, we do have a couple 
hopefully if you can answer it quickly, uh, do bees use goldenrod? Yes, I I, do. I've seen plenty of types of bees on goldenrod. Actually, in my office, a couple of feet from me, a beekeeper gave me a jar of goldenrod honey, um, but I've seen plenty of, of wild bees on goldenrod as well. So that's a, a neat um, late season uh, flower source uh, resource for them because you can help out bees. You'll see actually a wide range of pollinating insects on the goldenrod, flies, beetles, wasps, and, and so on. Uh, Marge Mattis had two, I think, related questions, really. Uh, she said she's heard some of the bee hotels you can buy are not good because the tubes are too short. And she also asked, what is the op optional, <laughs> sorry, optimal length for the tubes? I know when I've read about these, it depends on the bee species you're trying to attract, correct? So right. if you get any information online about these bee hotels, I assume it'll tell you the optimal lengths for different kinds of bees, right, and, and diameters. Right, right. Yeah, that brings up a good point. There's uh, differences in, in diameters, because if you have a, a relatively large tube that's maybe a quarter inch across, there's some bees that are smaller and won't like that. They simply won't use it. Um, and if you have small tubes where you've got bees that are larger, they're not going to be able to fit in there. So there are differences between all those species and types of bees, tube length, tube diameter, and, and so on. Uh, some of the, the fact sheets, publications from like Michigan State you shared, I, I believe have some information on that. There's not one single ideal size or length for these tubes. Also, I, I didn't mention in the talk today, but if you're really interested in uh, raising things like leafcutter bees and mason bees are two of the commonest ones. There are some really good knowledgeable vendors out there that sell bee houses and you can actually, uh, in some cases, uh, obtain the bees themselves. And one of the websites I uh, know has some good information on is Crown Bees. Um, so that would be a vendor to check out and they usually have good customer service and, and some pretty good information that I've seen on there as well. Okay, last but not least, uh, Connie Wilsnack wonders, what is a clear sign that it's a yellow jacket versus one of the other bees you talked about? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I mean, uh, to me as an entomologist, they look night and, night and day different. Um, some of the more subtle features, if you are like looking at a goldenrod flower in late summer, uh, not uncommon to have yellow jackets on there. Usually they're not going to be nearly as hairy as uh, a lot of our bees. And also the abdomen tends to have some very distinctive black and yellow stripes. There's actually not that many bees that have just black, yellow, black, yellow stripes like that. Um, so what I would suggest is do a, a online search for like yellow jacket coloration um, and, and find some good pictures of that and just kind of burn that into your memory because that's one of the easiest ways. There are some subtle differences, structure the head and things like that. But uh, I feel once you know what to look at, the color scheme, also the not super hairy, that can help out to separate them uh, as well. Under the microscope, there's a lot of different features to look at too, though. Okay, thank you. Thank you, PJ, and thank you for everyone uh, for being here. If you do have additional questions for PJ, you can certainly reach out to him at the Insect Diagnostic Lab, or you can contact your local county-based educator at your extension office. This has been recorded, so we will post it within a week or so up into our extension horticulture website after we get it closed caption. Steve, thanks for being here too, and uh, have a great day, everybody. Enjoy Pollinator Week. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to everyone who showed up to listen. <laughs>